uh, welcome to this uh, special discussion on peasant movement in India. India traditionally has been a country of varieties of social movements. May it be the tribal movement, workers movement, youth movement, women's movement, environmental movement, peasant movement and so many other kind of movements taking place in all parts of the country. In today's discussion, we shall be focusing on peasant movement in India. Before we go to that, first we will be narrating what we understand by social movement. It is quite important that at the very outset, uh, we should talk about social movement and its dynamic. Then we will be talking about the peasant society and its dynamics of peasant movement, uh, specifically focusing in the Indian context. So let us begin with what do you understand uh, by social movement. Usually social movement are taken into consideration an exceptional episode, like a special kind of manifestation of outrage of the people in the society. It is not. Social movement rather these are social because this is social movement. We are not talking about the social anti-movement. It is a movement that generated out of people desire to live in the society. It lies as fire in the heart of the society and it is like any other any other normal social phenomenon uh, but it is it is very explicit and explicit uh, expressive in its content that's why many of the many many of the uh, reputed social scientists talk about society flows in its own course and prior of movement lies within its own course to speak the truth and direction of the society in its own course it is widely talked about the social movement at the pulpit of the present because it predicts what is going to take place in, in our future society, what should be the direction and form of the future society that comes in terms of the direction given by social movement. It is a social movement, part of social progression that gives new thoughts, new ideas for action, new ideas for social policy and new ideas for implementation of the, uh, of the same. So by saying so, what I am trying to speak that social movement are not social anomalies. These are the ideas for the big change in the society. These are ideas for a new change in the society. These are ideas for transformation in the society. And it speaks about justice, equality and fraternity. And justice, fraternity and uh, equality is to be defined by the participant of a movement, those 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 who are the flag bearer of change, flag bearer of change and transformation in the society. So our intention here to uh, categorize social movement from that of a mob. You will be finding that is in society there are so many mob attacks. That is, people gathered together and uh, started uh, 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 expressing their dissent. Uh, with, with, without having immediate leadership, without having uh, immediate uh, organizational capability and it, it is not sustaining and not sustainable. So those, those are the mob, those are the faceless categories. But when we talk about social movement, we talk about a social movement which is organized, which is organized from within, which is organized from above, which is organized with the participation of the people and this is not individual social movement or the collective phenomenon it's the collective efforts of the people so when we are talking about the social movement we have to keep in mind we are not talk about the mob behavior we are talk about an organized social behavior an organized social effort to bring about the thought to bring about change in the thought in the belief, in the values, in the attitude, in the relationship, in the major institutional arrangement of the society. So it, it is not only to bring change, there can also be a social movement uh, to resist those changes, to resist the changes um, uh, in the thoughts, in the beliefs, the values, attitude, relationship and other institutional arrangement of the society. So wh what we are trying to emphasize is that social movement is a change agent. It is trying to bring a change in the society uh, by bringing change in the thoughts, beliefs, action and social relationship uh, in the social and institutional arrangement or resist change in those areas. 
by by saying so we, we, we have to underline certain important factor is that social movement should have an organization no social movement take place without an organization if it is not having an organization it can't be a movement because it's not sustaining it's not sustainable because a mob can be a social movement mob is not uh, based on certain organization it, it's a kind of a momentary outburst of people anger momentary outburst of people desire momentary outburst of of people uh, people aspiration uh, those are not guided by uh, any organizational setup so what is important is that a social movement should have an organization that should that should speak about its wider spectrum the spectrum is that it should have a leadership without having leadership no social movement can go because there may be millions of supporters of a movement but who will articulate the policy who will be the, how it will be interest articulation how there will be summation of interest of the people how the desire of the people will be expressed uh, in front of the authorities or in front of the opponents those who are opposing the movement so there should there is a role of a leader uh, in, in social movement so first is the organization second part is the leadership leadership is important component of social movement third important component is that if social movement is to be sustaining it should have an ideology what is an ideology ideology give legitimacy to the action legitimacy uh, for certain organization legitimacy to carry out certain futuristic perspective so it is it, 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 it is the ideology that gives an wider world view of a of a movement so third important component we talked about beside organization and leadership that is the ideology third important part is that social movement should be founded on collective mobilization so no social movement can sustain for long without having a sustainable collective mobilization so if a social movement is there it is to carry on it is to show its mobilization from one stage to another so mobilization should be there third is that interest articulation um, uh, that is the fifth fifth is the important interest articulation that is uh, a social movement organization and leadership should articulate the interest of the followers because we may have the social movement activist social movement participant social movement sympathizer social movement opponents but those who are the social movement participant and sympathizers they want to know what are the interests they are articulating whether they can be part with that uh, interest so it should be summation of the interest that should be expressed through the leadership and the organization the interest articulation is the important component then is that all social movements should have an ide identity it is it is the identity is what we are so it should talk about the what kind of identity they are constructing whether those identities are constructed in terms of local forces those identities are constructed in terms of wider forces whether those identities are constructed in terms of caste ethnicity region the region whether those identities are constructed in terms of nationality so all those thing comes in the way identity is constructed in a in a social movement so wider the construction of an identity wider is the spread of a social movement and wider is the possibility of its sustenance and third important component is that a social movement not only brings about change uh, and it also undergo changes and transformation over a period of time so what whatsoever we are talking about the first component of social movement is the organization second is the leadership third is the ideology fourth is the collective mobilization fifth is the interest articulation uh, sixth is identity formation seventh is the change and transformation so when we are talking about some of the basic features of uh, social movement change and transformation uh, let let us talk about uh, that is uh, what is the linkage of social movement with social transformation it is that every social movement is having a life history uh, it grows like a baby it acquires a kind of uh, maturity and also it goes a process of transformation so what we find that is there is a process of nurturing period acquiring the speak then the anti peak of a social movement but in the process of acquiring all those phases there is a possibility that a social movement will bring change not only in the society social movement also bring change uh, to itself at time a social movement become 
uh, changes itself to become a political party. When a social movement becomes a political party, it ceases to be a social movement, it becomes part of an establishment. Um, so that is one phenomenon. So what we find besides that also, when this is transforming, we find a social movement, maybe a, a revolutionary social movement, it may be transforming into a quasi-movement. What is the revolutionary social movement? Those who are talking about the far wide change in the institutional social fabric in the society. Uh, but gradually, those things are achieved. A social movement become a quasi movement because it looks about only a change in the limited dimensions of the society. So you can see a kind of a transformation of the social movement from a revolutionary to a quasi movement. Then you find another transformation of social movement, that is social movement that take was as a radical social movement. What of this radical? It is talking about immediate change. Ignore is that values, norm and culture and society, sudden outburst of organized action and it is a sudden but it remains only for a limited period of time. But the radical movements also gradually get transformed into a reformative movement. So there is a possibility of gradual transformation of a radical movement into a reformative movement. We also will be talking about how various social movements, those are the old social movement, gradually getting transformed into a new social movement. So old and new social movement, we'll be talking a little later. Uh, it is not in terms of chronology, in terms of the certain component. In terms of certain component, those components are getting transformed over a period of time from old to a new social movement. Now come to this, uh, you know, uh, certain, certain kind of a intersectionality that is, uh, we need not uh, consider that those uh, uh, radical, reformative, quasi, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary, uh, those need not be, uh, you know, contradictory to each other. One, over a period of time, one may be complementary to another because one social movement, but social movement based on collective mobilization, that collective mobilization paves the way for further arousal of consciousness, arousal of other international articulation in the society. So uh, one radical movement uh, paves the way for the emergence of varieties of other reformative social movement. That's why we find that process of mobilization and institutionalization may coexist within the movement itself. And when this, this thing coexists, we find there is a possibility of new areas of social movement that keep on taking place. So we'll be talking about um, those issues later, how, how a radical movement get institutionalized, how the new institutionalized movement paves the way uh, or creates the possibilities of further mobilization in the society. And uh, at this stage, let us go one step further. That is how, how, how social movements are perceived in the society by social scientists um, uh, in general and policy framers, the leaders on the other. Uh, social movements, because since it questions the established arrangement of the society, not always, but at times, it questions the established arrangement. Our functionalist scholar, those who widely talked about in terms of systemic inter integration, system adherence, systemic coherence, uh, they considered social movement are the disruptive uh, arrangement. They bring disruption to the social order that the dysfunctional. So, so social movement functionalist mostly, except a few, mostly uh, they avoided talking about social movement because these are the disruption that brings disruption in the social order. Uh, then we find another group of social scholars, those are the Marxist social scholars. Uh, they, they recognize social movement to be a social phenomenon, but uh, they have uh, followed the deductive logic that all social movement are the uh, class movement. So all social conflict are the class conflict. So it is a kind of a deductive approach and through the deductive approach, the possibilities of emergence of other kind of social identity rather than the class identity, class interest are not uh, explicitly available within the Marxian discourse. So what we find is a limitation in Marxian analysis of social movement, also limitation in the uh, functionalist uh, analysis of social movement. Uh, what we find, the social movement, 
uh, also widely there is the collective behavior perspective uh, uh, the our uh, our scholars those who are believing the collective behavior uh, they accepted even uh, it's a kind of a social phenomenon but it's a non institutionalized social phenomenon they accepted the collective behavior may be of two form one may be institutionalized form other may be uninstitutionalized so they accepted it it is a phenomenon but non institutionalized phenomenon but it is for the first time the symbolic interactionalist like um, heber and many other wh what they started talking about that is social movement it creates a space of creativity a space of arrival for the new in the society so there is a possibility that through social movement through the articulation of new interest through the articulation of the new dream there is the possibility of arrival of a new social uh, framework in the society so they 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 have found the arrival of something new in the social order so what we find that is looking all those thing another step further uh, that is there have been a dominant perspective uh, uh, two dominant perspective in social movement uh, theory one is that uh, resource mobilization perspective this is widely emerged in north america they talked about the democratic framework in the society that has emerged with the arrival of the welfare state that has given the space for the creation of politics within the state order that politics not only takes place within the state order through the parliamentary election it also create the space of varieties of the trade unions and other stakeholders of the society for the articulation of the interest so what they talk they are talking about there is a possibility of articulation of interest by the people and that interest is articulated very rationally in terms of cost and benefit so social movement uh, is a phenomenon that is emerging out of a democratic space that is created by the state the welfare state within that people participate how they participate they participate in terms of their rationality of action that is if i participate what i'll get in back so it is a kind of a rational calculation in terms of one's participation in the movement it is also talking about not only the people social movement also created by the political entrepreneurs how they created they created demand demand of conflict there is a conflicting situation a counter conflict situation is created um, so there is there, there is there are category of the political entrepreneurs they create the demand they create the possibility of alternative mobilization through a social movement propagate sustains with the rationality of human action so what they are talking also simultaneously that there is there is political opportunities available and within this political opportunities uh, there, there there is a possibility of liberation of human cognition what they are talking about when somebody is constructing a conflict by constructing a conflict they are they are creating a phenomena what they call contentious politics by constructing you are liberating your cognition you are liberating your thought process and you are contributing to the process of social framing and within this social framing you you are you are constructing the world that is to be you are constructing a world that is to be what you what you try to do you try to be very selective in your um, uh, in your uh, word in your punctuation in your uh, in your word so that it can motivate the people in the articulation of the interest you create an imaginary world in this imaginary world there is a demand there is a supply and those are done by the entrepreneurs taking cognizance of the rational behavior of the human being what i'll get if i participate so it is widely talked about in terms of political phenomenon political phenomenon that is available in north american uh, uh, countries and north american social science perspective there has also been wide talked about social movement in terms of identity perspective or to call the new social movement perspective what is the identity perspective it is talking about um, that is even the welfare state is the framework and within the welfare state there has been preponderance of labor movement there has been wide manifestation of varieties of these activities and all social group within that space are 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 interacting for the realization of the historicity that is a self conscious awareness to liberate one collective identity and so what they find here in earlier case um, of uh, resource mobilization perspective 
one's participation was guided by one interest here one's participation is widely conditioned by one subjectivity one idealism and one morality so it 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 it, it is not only talking in terms of your interest it is beyond your interest because you are participating for certain calls when you are participating in a national movement you are guided by subjectivity you are guided by idealism when you are participating in the environmental movement you are participating in the human rights movement women's movement so what you find you find enormously conditioned by certain subjectivity and certain idealism a kind of a liberation you, you look for the space within the historical condition of the society so what it is talking about it is kind of new kind of identities what is those new kind of identities I'll in earlier case, we found the Marxian identities created identity in terms of only class. The uh, 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 American perspective, that is resource mobilization or political process perspective, it, this, this created a category in terms of occupational interest or a professional interest. Here we find a new kind of identities, those are constructed with the intersectionality of global local inter, uh, linkages in terms of the concern for globality, humanity, humanitarianism, environment, gender, the farmer, the peasants and other. And these are widely founded not on economic conditioning but in terms of certain social mooring, social norms and values. So it is a response of certain identities, certain collectivities following the non-violence means to acquire, to make a society an ideal place to live where subjectivity, idealism will be the precondition in people's survival. So protest comes in, the protest is founded on subjectivity, idealism and morality. What we find when uh, now the social movement across the globe is, is taking place, so social movement has not remained social movement a local phenomenon. We find the social movement, those who have grown in terms of um, uh, civil liberties movement in America or the anti-black anti movement in America that has spread across the world. What we find the farmers movement or the peasant movement in India, it has been part of a global movement. Environmental movement taking place in India, part of the global movement, so are the women's movement. So we find there has been a proliferation of movement at a global level, what we call in terms of movements of movement, that is so many movements are articulating in one place and getting a link widely. So it is creating um, a phenomenon of a social movement society in which individual identities are getting misplaced by a global identity. Everybody is becoming part of a movement society, speaking in terms of equality, fraternity and justice and uh, how to stand. But simultaneously within this process, there is a, uh, while we are talking about a process of liberating mechanism, liberating phenomenon, there has also emergence of coercive phenomenon. What are those coercive phenomena? There has also been within this formation of global social movement, there has been construction of abstract identity, essence and symbol that speaks in terms of only purity and uh, homogeneity, that champion only the absolute and accept the attitude to do and die and they try to, they don't allow the space for the growth of free discussion. So it, it, it's a kind of a hegemonic movement, how do you talk it in terms of extremist movement that talks about the uh, absolute and that destroyed the scape of the whole space for social mobility, uh, social movement that is and also the, uh, rather they fight against the social movement uh, that speak for the liberty, fraternity and justice. So what Vavikra and other widely talked about, the contemporary world has also been marked by the proliferation of social anti-movement. That is, these are not the movement, they are the social anti-movement that squeezes the space for the liberation in terms of citizenship, in terms of other available instrument of empowerment of people in the society. So what we find, these are the white framework. That is white framework, that is we are talking about a social movement and organized activities. That organized activities are widely conditioned by interest on the one hand, identity on the other. That is also widely conditioned by in terms of proliferation of social movement and social anti-movement. And if that is the phenomenon, the question even how do you like to see the proliferation of peasant movement within it? What is the nature of a social uh, peasant movement? How it gets transformed and how it uh, evolves and uh, what are the ramifications for the wider society? 
Before going that, let us briefly talk about what do we understand by peasant um, in, in our society, uh, in, a, in, a, in a vocabulary, in a, is a conventional academic vocabulary. Usually when you are talking about uh, peasant, we usually take into consideration that is peasant are a category of the people. Those who are attached to the land, attached to the land to eke out their livelihood. By eking out livelihood, we are uh, emphasizing on this phenomenon because they are attached to the land in different capacities. They are attached to the land to eke out their livelihood, not to make profit. Because they are having no, uh, not making, making profit, profit is not a sin. But what is that? They are not having the capacity to make the profit. So ultimately what they do, a peasants usually, they are the economically, socially and politically marginalized group and provide the basis for large scale mass mobilization in the society. If that is a peasant social category, how do you like to conceptualize peasant in Indian society? Let us come to an empirical phenomenon. Empirical phenomenon is that peasant in India represent the vast mass of the landless agricultural laborer, vast mass of agricultural laborer, the sharecroppers, the tenant, the poor artisans, the small and marginal cultivators who work on land to eke out their livelihood primarily from agriculture by their own labor. Keep in mind what is important is that as a category, they are laborers, they are sharecroppers, they are the tenant, they are the poor artisans, they may be the small and marginal cultivators, but they are only predominantly working on the land to eke out their livelihood for their livelihood sustenance. They are not, they are having no capacity to work on land to generate surplus or to make profit by engaging themselves. Second part is that they work on land by engaging their own labor. They are having no capacity to hire other labor. So what we found that is labor, um, they are mostly in, in Indian society, they are the semi-landless and the marginal landholding categories. They are the marginal workers. They mostly predominantly remain on or underemployed in the rural areas. They experience the problem of unemployment in the rural areas, seasonal employment, also gender-based waste segregation. You may be knowing in the rural area, though it is widely eradicated, conventionally women are paid lesser wages than the male folk in the society, in the, in the, in, in the rural workforce. But what we find, a vast section of the uh, this peasant belong to the category of uh, poverty ridden people. They belong to the below poverty line and as the, they are productive from the land is very low. So what we find, um, uh, the whole element of marginality is reinforced on the peasantry. When you are using the term marginality, sociologically you should be very careful. That is, uh, we are talking peasant as a marginal category. Uh, as a marginal category, we means when you talk about a marginal category, number one, they are deprived of, they suffer from the element of economic, social and political denial in the society. The denial in terms of access to the productive resources, less access to the political power, less access to the social uh, hierarchy. Um, higher status, and they remain mostly political underdogs. So, and they also remain culturally uh, some people an uh, outsider from within. They are a part society and part culture. So, they are the marginalized people. The when the marginalized people not only denied, they are also they are also reproduced in the society uh, through the process of socialization, reproduction of inequality in the society. And another important part is that marginalized people being marginalized, living in the lower rung of the society, inherit the potential of collective mobilization in the society. So they are the epitome of, many a time, they have remained the epitome of deviant social behavior, the epitome of social uh, uh, revolt, and also they are the uh, uh, participant, the active participant in the present movement. In showing, uh, saying so, let us talk about the present movement in India, the, how it has taken place and the kind of participation uh, they have taken in Indian society. Uh, India has been, as, we, uh, as I have told, that it has been a land of agriculture and uh, agrarian inequality has been part of uh, the Indian 
heritage since the days of colonial rule in India. So India has seen the uh, vehement peasant movement even uh, during independence struggle. We found the peasant movement, the Chandichora movement, the Bardole movement. Um, uh, then we found the enormous tribal movement. So we find uh, uh, all those movement, wide participation of the uh, peasant under, under uh, Gandhi's leadership. Then immediately after independence, um, we found that discontent, those who were growing in the agrarian society in India, uh, those were manifested in the form of Teghava movement uh, that took place 1946-47 in undivided Bengal. Telangana movement took place in 1948 and 52 in Andhra Pradesh. The Naxalite movement took place in 1969-72 again in Bengal. Shingur movement in Bengal and varieties of the peasant movement it has taken place in all parts of the country. So what we found that is peasant movement has proliferated in many parts of this country and there have been uh, participation of the poor peasant, those precisely from the civil tribe settled caste and other background. Now let us come, uh, just for example, what is the basic cause, the, why the peasant participate in the peasant movement, how, how, how this movement sustained over a period of time. Uh, the Tevaga movement took place because it was uh, with the main slogan was that uh, land to the tillers. Uh, why the land to the tillers? Because the land, those who were possessed by the land, gradually those land got transferred to the intermediary landowners and the small landowners uh, become either the shear coppers or the tenant in the same piece of land or the agricultural laborer. And they are cultivating, getting only 50% of the produce. And uh, there was a report, even by Bengal Famine Commission in 1941 um, 39, uh, that uh, one third of the shear to be given to the, uh, the Tebhaga, that is one third of the shear uh, uh, to be given. So, what the, they started talking about. Uh, through this movement that instead of one third, they should be given two third of the share. That is uh, more than, uh, they should be given 66 percent of the produce rather than 50 percent of the produce which was traditionally given to them. So uh, they uh, uh, revolted for that and uh, there was a combined opposition both by the state and the administration and uh, that movement uh, collapsed. And uh, but whatsoever the idea generated out of this movement uh, that was integrated um, in the land reform policy of government of India 1952. That is um, land ceiling was introduced, then um, uh, tenancy uh, reform was introduced and no eviction of the share copper was a provision within the, that. So what we find the, that whatsoever the idea generated out of a movement that has been a matter of public policy and administration at the later stage, whether those are implemented or not, if those are not implemented, uh, what kind of social reaction has been towards it? That has been another phenomenon, another research question uh, that is dealt with by the researcher. So what we find, one movement has created the space uh, for this, uh, for this uh, another movement and these movements were uh, widely um, sustained for a longer period of time and uh, this, uh, this movement, uh, uh, what happened, these are mostly uh, a radical social movement and this uh, radical social movement in that way, it challenged the established rules and law of, uh, of the country. And a uh, major participant in those movements are the civil caste, civil tribes, and the civil caste women and the tribal women. And uh, then, then we find a lot of, uh, they're widely guided by sense of economic security. And uh, since they're guided by the economic insecurity, they followed the political path, the political path of collective mobilization um, uh, to bring a kind of uh, uh, greater economic share uh, for them. So what we find that is that movement continued, but gradually uh, similar kind of radical movement also took place in the Telangana movement. Uh, and then we find similar radical movement took place in the Noxal uh, body movement. But gradually those movement got transformed into, into uh, radical to institutionalized movement. At this stage, uh, le le let us go uh, talk about some phenomenon of this uh, radical and reformative uh, social movement. Uh, when we talk about uh, radical uh, peasant movement, uh, a radical movement having specific goal. They are hostile against the institution, norms, 
and uh, they look for structural change and look for egalitarianism. Let, let us explain it a little bit. That is, uh, there have a very specific goal. They don't go to the wider goal. What is the radical goal for the Telangana movement? It was, uh, the Tevanga movement, it was like this, land to the tiller. Okay, the share coppers be given uh, uh, two-thirds of the share. Uh, that was a very specific goal. And then uh, it came to the another phase that is very hostile against the institution. It was hostile against the state. It was hostile against the landowner. And their hostility was reflected in terms of their hostile action against the state. And they, 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 they were against the established norms, values, and moorings. And so, so what they did, they, they revolted against the landowners. They took arms in their hand. And what they asked for? They asked for a big structural change in the society. What is the structural change? The land to the tiller. Land was belonging to the big landowners. No, land should come to the tiller. Those who are owning the land should come to the name. So a demand articulation, interest articulation was uh, the part of that. They also give the framework radical um, uh, movement and egalitarianism. Let us look into how the reformative movement look into that. Reformative movement is having a diverse goal. They will talk about the, uh, you know, uh, simultaneously interest of the share coppers, agricultural laborer, poor farmers differently and their hostility will be guided. It will not be um, as guideless hostility. It, it is totally uh, within the given parameters and this will be adhered to certain norms and values and reformative arrangement of the society. And second important part is that it go by that it is only single uh, ideology and, and it is there with secret organization. Uh, but uh, what you find it is a multiple ideology that is reformative it is not only one organization is moving giving uh, leadership to the movement there are multiple organization uh, we find there's a proliferation of um, se several political organization started giving leadership to this um, uh, movement so earlier it is a secret organization in that case we find the open organization now the radical movement try to see uh, most of the participant to be the change agent, but in that case, uh, the reformative movement they try to see everybody to be the beneficiaries because you want to take part, you will get benefits. In other cases, you are the change agent, you are changing yourself, you are also being changed to the society. Then, radical movement to widely get opposition from the state and at time of the civil society, uh, but here. Uh, radical movement, institutionalized, the reformative movement, many times these are, uh, you know, sponsored by the state. Take into consideration the uh, whole issue of uh, empowerment of women, the issue of empowerment of the uh, agricultural laborer and share coppers. So these are part of the state reformative package and they go for mobilization of the peasant share coppers through the panchayat raj institutions. Now what is happening, another part is that um, radical movement uh, uh, usually revolt against the dependency and domination, but uh, uh, in the reformative movement, uh, within the a structure of dependency and domination is inculcated that many of them, many of these poor peasants may be uh, immersed to be dependent on so many brokers and intermediaries. Uh, within the society. So wh wh what you find that the trend of mobilization which starts with the radical peasant movement over a period of time uh, it may become reformative. When becoming reformative it brings lot of alteration in the basic feature of the social movement. What are those basic features that is we talked about being change in, the, in its organization, being change in the leadership, it brings changes in its ideology, it brings changes uh, in its mobilization pattern, in its interest articulation, um, in, its, uh, in its own idea and relationship with the state and other agencies. So it, it go the whole process of transformation uh, within the society, within the social movement culture. Now what is happening now we find that uh, now interest articulation uh, of present in the society. Now it is having multifaceted interest articulation uh, with uh, varieties of new new agencies. Those are working in the society. Uh, how this interest articulated? Um, now we find that interest articulation of the peasants are now taking place through the peasants and the organized political parties for the distribution of the development scheme. And what we find is the peasants get polarized in terms of the affiliation of particular political parties and affiliation to the panchayat so that they can be the beneficiaries. So what we find uh, a new agencies have come um, to, to give direction 
to the peasant as a social group, those who are the marginalized group in the society. Now what we find that uh, peasants, so when they are participating through the panchayat and political party, there is every possibilities that is the peasant's ideas and interest are get co-opted by the political parties and also by uh, the civil society and other stakeholders. So there is a possibility that um, whom we are aspiring or thinking, the uh, we means the peasants are thought of uh, to be the change agent and uh, the intelligentsia try to describe them as a change agent, they find them to be a dependent category. They are a co-opted category, co-opted by the political parties in the civil society. Now we find another a, a change in the whole framework. The framework change comes in, in terms of leadership. Peasant society usually don't get the leadership um, usually, not always, usually um, leadership from within, uh, they, they get the leadership from the middle class or the urbanites. So when they are getting leadership from the urbanites, um, the dependency on the urbanites remain a part. So it is, it, uh, many times the leadership does not arise from within, but they, they, they remain dependent on the arrival of the leadership from the outside. But this is, this is not the typical case. Uh, there may be uh, so many leadership now have started coming from the within. Now we find that is, um, uh, there is a multiplicity of uh, proliferation of uh, peasant movement. Um, earlier, the peasant movement were fighting only for the distribution of the land with the, with the, with the identity of peasants in the society. Um, but we find that the peasant movement has got gradually transformed for the assertion of various kind of uh, other kind of rights. I'll give two important examples. One example may come from the northern part of Bengal where the um, Tebaka movement took place. So here there was a process of inculcation, articulation of peasant as a marginalized category. Uh, and, uh, uh, notwithstanding their affiliation to certain ethnic caste or uh, other kind of categories, uh, religious categories. Now, now over a period of time, there has been, uh, since those, uh, those um, issues of the peasants are not solved, uh, within the economic uh, categorization, the marginal category or uh, proletariat category, um, there has been uh, articulation of the ethnic identities. The Rajbangshi identity, identity of the scheduled caste is articulated to assert for their identity within the wider zone of North Bengal that is that has aspired for a, a, a statehood within the state uh, like this. So what we find uh, similarly in, in uh, Andhra Pradesh, there has been a process of articulation of uh, ethnic identities. Th those were the um, identities of the peasant that took place uh, during this Telangana movement. Gradually, uh, the ethnic identity of Telangana uh, state, the um, within the state the, uh, of Andhra Pradesh, it articulated. So, what we find uh, then also within that, we find uh, there is an enormous proliferation of gender identity, enormous proliferation of the OBC, uh, Madiga, Malla identities, the farmers' identities the gender identities. So what we find, there has been enormous proliferation of identities, that is what we call proliferation of multiplicity of identity within that. So what we find, the peasant movement, those who are founded on the old model of identity formation in terms of class, has got transformed into the formation of new social identities in terms of ethnicity, caste, and gender. So what you find social movement of the peasant, the peasant movement as a variant of social movement is not necessarily has remained peasant movement per se. It has been diversified in the form of ethnic movement, caste movement and also uh, articulation of the gender interest. The important part is that uh, what has been the consolidation of interest uh, within that each of those categories. Now uh, we find that uh, there has been assertion since the identities have not remained consolidated uh, because when we talk about identity, we find that identity a, a kind of a consolidated identity to take place uh, either in terms of class, in terms of caste or, or in terms of ethnicity. Now we find that there has been um, a kind of a, a formulation of even individual identities, individual assertion. 
and those individual assertion um, those the critic the power the critic the dominant section of the society the peasants critiquing of the domination uh, dominant section of the society um, by distortion of the abbreviation by articulating satire forming the rhymes at time uh, making wits um, uh, against the dominant categories uh, those individual assertion also take place so what we find those articulation of identity those who are at the collective level now this, those are quietly getting um, diversified the the uh, uh, resistance is there but may not be collective resistance becoming individualized but getting linked uh, uh, through satire rhymes and etc like this so what you find there in the alti uh, alternative forms of collective uh, identity formation those alternative forms are in terms of ethnicity caste gender language and also in terms of individual assertion of identities um, in the society uh, now if we have to look into how those were getting uh, transformed uh, we have to look into autonomy of those identities um, how those autonomies uh, how, how those identities are articulating autonomy uh, within the wider framework because if, if uh, resistance or the movements are to be articulated they are guided by certain uh, organization is it possible to to get a space for those um, uh, autonomous articulation here is a kind of interdependency between the uh, what we call uh, consolidation of identity at one end and uh, uh, deconsolidation of identity at another end it is getting consolidated maybe at the uh, uh, at one end in the form of ethnicity gender and caste also getting diluted in the name of or in the form of uh, economic identities on the other a kind of a mutual contrasting identity formation um, taking place uh, in the prison society but overall what has happened all identities are getting encapsulated um, within the uh, local realities and wider context that is giving the shape of uh, citizenship identity uh, in our in our society and this citizenship identity is quite important in that way uh, it, 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 it is it is helping the prison to develop the prison praxis what is the prison praxis prison praxis is a kind of a theory of action through ontology of their being and becoming in the in the prison society and this this prison ontology or prison axis praxis is quite important in that way because prison till now they remain victim of livelihood insecurity uh, because they are the poverty written uh, people living below the poverty line they are the illiterate they are the migrant migrating from one part of the country to another and also they are they, they are simultaneously self asserting and how they are self asserting they are self asserting themselves um, through their connectivity now that connectivity that space for connectivity they have been evolved through prolonged period of negligence and victimhood they have suffered in the society and they are making that a tool of their assertion through the democratic process of getting affiliated to one political party or the other so what we find there has been a process of articulation of prison praxis within the wider democratic framework of the society and that is uh, providing the uh, prison a, a kind of a scope not the the scope a scope for the articulation of their discontent um, in the society so what we have said uh, in our lecture today very precisely we have tried to talk about uh, what is a social movement uh, how the social movement are conceptualized in terms of certain fundamental features uh, that is in terms of its uh, uh, you know present movement is an organized action uh, either for change or to resist change and it is to be um, guided by an organization leadership interest articulation uh, and the mobilization process also movement is undergoing a process of change we also simultaneously talked about uh, how the prison movement is conceptualized uh, by the traditional functionalist scholar the marxist scholar um, the symbolic interactionist scholar uh, collective theorist scholar uh, 
um, the resource mobilization, and also we talked about simultaneously identity perspective of uh, 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 movement studies. Then we tried to also, uh, understand uh, who are present. We have tried to understand present as a marginalized category in the society, and we have talked about they have been marginalized, becoming victims of varieties of social, economic, political, and cultural deprivation in the society. Those are reproduced in varieties of the forms, and being marginalized, they have been the flag bearer of varieties of revolts uh, and discontent in the society. Those are reflected in varieties of the prison movement. We have also talked about how prison movements have undergone change over a period of time uh, from radical to reformative. And now when it has become reformative, it has changed from the old to the new movement, becoming diversified in its attitude. And but even being diversified, they have articulated the praxis within the democratic uh, framework uh, of politicization and political interest articulation of their interest. Hope um, you have uh, uh, articulated certain question. Should we have some, you may, you may post it uh, in our uh, Facebook. Uh, I'll be happy to answer and respond uh, to all of your queries. Thank you. Thank you for being with us.